can't directly, but there's a randomization procedure that we can use to uh, address that question and give us a statistic to say whether of a significant level of any similarity or difference. And this is called the Leash um, Equivalency Test. Again, uh, I've said it's in Farmerclin, but it's also in this mode, and I'm sure you can uh, find it in other software packages as well. So, the assumption that we're testing with this test is that the um, observations for species one and species two really come from the same distribution. So they're really the same thing. So our test takes our two species and we randomly repartition this data so that we create a new species one and species two. So here, this is our resampling. So all the black dots now become species one and all the red dots now become species two. Okay? We then build new models for the red species and the black species. And we project them into our um, environment, uh, into our geographic space. And we use the D and the I statistic to measure the similarity for these random partitions. Okay? And then we end up with a value, okay, this is D of 0.8. We do this a lot of times, hundred times, a thousand times, depending on uh, how much time we've got ourselves. And we end up with a distribution profile of our metric. So we've run a hundred replicates and most of the time we've got some middling value and we've got a distribution profile. And then we compare the observed <coughs> statistic, D or I, based on our real species, and we see where that distribution falls in relation to our randomizations. If it's outside of uh, the 99th uh, percentile, then we'll say it's significant, depending on what threshold you want to use. Okay? And this gives us a statistical test to say whether these two niches are the same or different. But as Rob presented earlier, um, there's some questions about whether this test is perhaps too sensitive and too ready to um, um, conclude that our um, uh, projected niches are different when really they're the same. And so this is the example where um, uh, these two niches are um, significantly non-identical according to the test, but in fact these two uh, niches were resampled from one niche. Okay? So this is an example that says perhaps this test, test is overly sensitive and too readily says that things are different. So it's the test that's most widely used, but you know, it's not perfect. And, and this is a picture of the thing that uh, I, I believe that if these two are really one species and these are the things that were compared and they were uh, shown to be different. So, a warning on these comparisons again. Um, whether we regard things as similar or different rather depends on our perspective. Okay? Now, if we were to use our test on this area, do you think that our test would say that this, is, this comes out as similar or different? Why? Because most of the area they disagree on presence or absence. What about if we consider this area? Yeah, they're going to be the same. Why are they going to be the same? They have to be the same, almost the same area. Yeah. So all of this area, the two models agree that both species don't occur here. 
Okay? So we need to remember what we're comparing. Yeah? We're not just comparing presence, we're comparing absence. And so in this context, our issues are very similar because they all predict absence in the same place. In this instance, they're very different because they predict lots of presences in very different places. It's completely the same climate, and there's a big river, and they being separated, nothing changed. Okay. Yeah, but you know, if if the environment is the same here and the same here, and we've done a good model, shouldn't we expect to pick out both areas? Yeah, but it's also the input. Yeah, she did. If you use a max and input. That's the difference between the, the, the method by Brunima and the other, that, that chooses the PCA as the input and not the, the niche model. Yeah. So if you have a wrong niche model, put it in there, it will tell you. Yes, if you, if, if, if you have a bad model, then anything you do with that model is going to be bad. <laughs> so maybe the, the statistics perform well with the model. Yeah. might not be able to conclude if you have very different environmental layers about the real difference between emissions and internal environment. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's just one degree of temperature for example difference there and it's with, you know, not really a different environment yeah. for us. Yeah. I understand that's it. That's it. Yeah. I completely agree with you Chris and yeah. I'm wondering if another way to say it is this effect happens because these tests in geographic space, <coughs> in essence, are not weighting environmental yeah. conditions yeah. equally. Yeah. They are each environmental condition is weighted by how frequent it is in geography. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and so, um, it, it's a, it's a real issue that, that what we're looking at is the realized niche, yeah. and we're comparing the realized niche by looking at geography. And yeah, when we when we got uh, what we're not comparing is a sort of Response. Well, and also that these tests are specific to a particular region yeah. where you're doing your analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you could sort of have, have a thought experiment where you've got a species that occurs on, say, two different islands, and on two species on two islands, and on the one species, one island, their niche looks exactly the same, and on a different island, their niche looks different, just because. The, uh, the the environmental space available on those two islands mm. are not the same. Okay. So it's important to keep in mind the the, 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 the flaws in this sort of approach. But if we can measure niche correlation, we can have some um, reasonable um, trust in what it's telling us. We can do some useful and, and interesting things with it. So here's a phylogeny of uh, coniferous plants. And here's a matrix that shows niche similarity. Yeah? And the dark squares show high levels of similarity. And the white squares show low levels of similarity. Now, actually, the metric used here is not the D or the I statistic, but a different measure of um, similarity. Um, to quickly go into that, um, what this does is it takes the, the occurrence points of the two species and then looks at how well the model for one species predicts the points of the other species. So you have a non-symmetric test. So draws for an indicate here is an incredibly wide range of species. So it completely encompasses the range of most other species. But if you look at that Drosera indica this way around, it's basically a white line because it encompasses, but then the other way around, the, the restricted range of species can't predict very many of the points. Okay? So it's an non-symmetric measure, but it also shows some, of, um, some measure of niche similarity that is different from the DMR. Okay? But what you can see when you look at this phylogeny is you can see 
This plate here has this big black block associated with it. And it suggests that these, this clay is really conserved and it has a, a bunch of species with really similar niches. Okay? This clay, not so much. And then you've got this plate at the bottom where it's a sort of mixed <coughs> message. But just the just the, 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 the process of performing our niche comparison of our species. Looking at that from a phylogenetic context tells us something about um, uh, niche conservancy in different groups. But what is the main difference between this approach and doing a simple overlay of all models, a geographic overlay of all models? What is the a geographic overlay of all the models will, will show you that, um, yeah, okay, this species and this species are in the same geographic location. But it won't tell you whether they in, have the same environmental niche because the, 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 the sister species might be somewhere else. Yeah. So I will do both. <laughs> and you can get you can get um, really cool um, uh, with uh, tree base. There was a way that you could take your tree and put the branches of the, of the tree. And take them to a geographic location, and then you can basically have a map where your phylogeny, all the branches of the phylogeny, of the point to the locations that they occur. It's really nice, only for this example, the crosser example, it's globally distributed species, and the, it tends to be added up with a branch of my phylogeny sort of piercing the world. Because it's in 3D. Uh, anyway, so um, the, the comparison of um, uh, um, niches um, on a phylogeny leads to a, a, a question of um, what, what level of niche conservatism do we see when we look at this? Okay, so um, we're talking uh, about niche conservatism. We expect that closely related species will have similar niche. So we should we should see a pattern appearing where we have high niche overlap means that species are closely related. So here, age to most recent common ancestor. Anything on this side means that the species have very recent common ancestors. They're closely related. We should see higher niche overlap. Distantly related species, we expect to have different niches, and so we should see low niche overlap. We expect this kind of pattern. But now, if we have a phylogeny, if we have a measure of this, if we have our niche overlap, we have a measure of this. So we can plot them and see what relationship we see. And this is an example from the literature, Evans et al., um, 2009. Okay. Here, we have our measure of They've called it relative disparity, so it's a metric of niche similarity. And here we've got relative time. They don't have a dated tree, but they have uh, an undated tree, so they, they can't. The, the differences between branch chains are relative time. And they see a pattern for some, and not so much of a pattern for others. I'm sorry, if the relative disparity is high values is different, so if the opposite from the last uh, cartoon you showed us? Uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, disparity is the mean of the squared pairwise differences between all terminal facts are defined by each node. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that does seem to be the wrong way around, doesn't it? So the expectation would be like this, for this graph? Yes. And what are the two that are shown? You have a dark and a hatch? Species. Can you read that? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, different species. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So we've got one example of conservatism, and most of the others are not. That's a good spot. Okay, 
So we can do this sort of graph in uh, so the age range correlation um, is something that um, uh, is, is unique to file, the file package. And we essentially just do this plot and we look at the slope. And uh, this is an example that we're going to do in the practical. Um, this, this, this statistic we, we do, we plot our points, we do a simple regression line, but the, there's a statistical test we can do where we randomize the niches across the phylogeny. So for each ran randomization, we just have a permutation of where the niches fit on the phylogeny. We then redraw the line, and the expectation is that um, Oh, the, the question is, is the observed pattern here different than we expect from just the random, random permutations of the um, observed issues in the phylogeny? Okay, now here the grey lines represent each of the randomizations, and we can see that this is not significant and it doesn't show our expected pattern. So we say that here, we say that there's no. Um, Niche conservatism based on this test.